Hi and welcome. Here we're going to talk about how thiazide diuretics can be used to treat nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So let's start off with our relationship between thiazide diuretics and how they're used to treat nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And as a reminder, NDI presents with polyuria, that's uh, two liters or more of urine a day for children, or three liters of urine a day or more for adults polydipsia or excess water intake, and noctria, which is excess urination at night. Likewise, there will be a decrease in urine osmolality of 300 milliosmoles per kilogram. That's because of the excess water secretion by the kidney. And then finally, uh, with that excess water loss, the plasma will have a concentrated sodium, which will be a greater than 145 milliequivalents per day. Let's turn our attention to how thiazide diuretics are then used to treat nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And let's acknowledge the fact that it seems counterintuitive to give a diuretic to somebody who's already urinating too much. All right, so again, as a reminder, thiazide diuretics uh, inhibit the sodium chloride co-transporter. That's what this red negative mark represents. Uh, and that's located in the distal convoluted tubule. Down here, we have a diagram of that. And so we have the NCC co-transporter in the apical membrane, which transports one sodium and one chloride. And then that sodium is then reabsorbed across the basolateral membrane via the sodium potassium ATPase, while the chloride is reabsorbed by a chloride channel. With that, there's a decrease in the sodium reabsorption along the distal convoluted tubule. And that's what sets up the decrease in water reabsorption along the collecting duct. Here we have an illustration of a tubule with the distal convoluted tubule segment or diluting segment located here, and then the connecting segment and collecting duct located just downstream. And as a reminder, the distal convoluted tubule is permeable only to sodium chloride, while the connecting segment and collecting duct are permeable to sodium chloride and water. So uh, in the presence of thiazide diuretics, sodium chloride is not reabsorbed, so it remains in the lumen. And so that luminal gradient, which normally is much greater, uh, will be diminished. So we have 250 milliosmoles across the luminal uh, side and then 300 milliosmoles in the uh, interstitial side. So we have a very small gradient for water to be reabsorbed by the time it reaches the connecting segment and collecting duct. So this is why there's less water being reabsorbed because of the gradient is diminished in the distal convoluted tubule. And then that in turn leads to a decrease in the extracellular fluid volume. And that has two main effects. One, it increases the driving force for water consumption. So that's where we have this up arrow here. And then that helps treat nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Likewise, it increases water reabsorption in the kidney. And that occurs because first and foremost, the decrease in extracellular fluid volume leads to a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. And when that happens, there's a reflexive increase in water reabsorption along the proximal convoluted tubule. That's what we see right here. So basically, as you slow the flow, you're, you'll, you will increase more water uh, being reabsorbed along this segment. Likewise, sodium and potassium, anything that's along the proximal tubule, more of it will be reabsorbed. It's the bulk transport. So instead of 65% of it being reabsorbed, it's closer to 85 or maximal. That in turn, increases the renal water reabsorption, which helps with the treatment of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So this is all a volume component. And then finally, the inhibition of the sodium chloride co-transporter leads to a decrease in sodium reabsorption that we have here, and then that will help treat the hypernatremia. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, I've included a blank version of this uh, graph here for you to fill out. Uh, thank you and good luck.